Uh, thank you for joining us in our first uh, Making a Meaning uh, Sire faculty and directors uh, lectures. Uh, this is something that we've been doing every year, uh, which is invite uh, SIAC faculty to actually kind of complement some of the assignments that we do in the work and kind of like let, uh, in a way, try to expand the points of view that they, as they relate to the introduction of, of students to the discipline of architecture. So in the next four weeks, you'll see uh, kind of quite different voices and ways of looking uh, at the discipline and how to uh, portray that. Uh, let me see that it's an honor to introduce somebody that doesn't need any introduction, uh, Mr. Eric Owen Moss. Um, the reason why I wanted to say two or three words before that is just like I was remembering, I, I think it was almost 18 years ago that I was sitting on, on, on your side. Um, and, and on my first or second day of architecture, I thought I had a brilliant idea, which was to combine philosophy and architecture together. That day, I thought that nobody else done it before. Of course, I was like 18 years old. I could do anything I wanted. Uh, until my first assignment, well, actually, I started the dual major in philosophy and architecture. Uh, I realized uh, after the first assignment that somebody had done it before. You know, I had to draw a Louis Kahn house, and the way, uh, actually, a school, and the way he was uh, describing it was like through philosophical ideas. So I said, like, man, I better shape up with this thing. Uh, it took me about six months to realize that the dual career wasn't uh, necessary anymore, that it was enough in the discipline of architecture to explore ideas. Uh, and, and I think it's like over the course of the years, I had the wonderful opportunities to, pe uh, to meet people that have the two qualities together. One is like the ability to think, and the other one has the, the idea to operate as, a, as an architect and, and build our world. Uh, it is what a lot of pleasure to introduce you to Eric Owen Moss, architect, philosopher, and SARC director. You can barely reach it, baby. Um, thanks a lot. Alexis, uh, you'll get to know Alexis soon, uh, if you haven't already, for better and for even better, and every once in a while for worse. Uh, he's a very unusual talent, and I think in many ways the perfect character for this drama um, that we call Making and Meaning. And I think what's, what's particularly uh, intriguing about Alexis, and it'll be something that won't connect with all of you, but maybe with some of you, maybe with more than a few, is his capacity to imagine and to think in unorthodox spatial uh, shape, in material terms, but also with one eye simultaneously on what would it take to implement it, to construct it, to make it, to realize it in the world. And what you'll see uh, in, in more general terms in the discourse of architecture around the world, and particularly the academic venues, is there's often a split between conceptual, theoretical, intellectual, philosophical models of how architecture might be done. And those who are able to, to implement and to construct, and I think one of the appealing qualities of, of SciArc, and this isn't consistently true, but it's true more than it isn't true, and it's always an aspiration, is to bring people into the discourse, and I'm talking about faculty now, who practice, who build and, and think together, so that what you begin to understand is an obligation not just to participate in a theoretical discourse, uh, but to think in a very particular way about what it will take to realize 
what you're imagining here on the street, in the city, in the world. I think that's always been, for all the changes, uh, for all of the evolution that takes place and will continue to take place here, that's, I think, a consistent aspect of, of the discussion. Anyway, uh, what, what I wanted to talk about today, uh, by the way, uh, I should welcome all of you. I think, is this just making and meaning or the other people? Yeah, but uh, I think making and meaning is for obvious, or maybe not so obvious reasons, a very critical program for SciArc and for you as well. Because the first step you take is not necessarily the same as the 25th step you take. So the way it's introduced, the way the subject is introduced, the way it's made available, the way it's talked about, what it can do, what its capacities are to move the world and the discussion of the world, what it is, what it should be, what it might become, come to you first in making and meaning. So again, I think we've, we've looked at this program over the last few years as very critical as an introduction to many of you uh, who will continue to, to participate over the years uh, in that process, which is one of the reasons Alexis is, is running the program. Anyway, there are two pieces to this <clears throat> discussion. And I think I'll, I'm, in, in this case, in both of the two cases, using myself as an example. And what I'm going to show you are two instances of two very recent discussions that I've been involved in. One has to do with an attempt by uh, a friend, I have to say a friend and a colleague by the name of Patrick Schumacher, who's Zaha Hadid's partner, some of you know uh, their work, who uh, published a book very recently called Autopoiesis of Architecture. Uh, which follows by about 80 years the publication of this book uh, by the Museum of Modern Art in New, York, in New York, authored by Philip Johnson. Some of you know that name, uh, who's an architect of some reputation and probably more interesting as a critic and a discoverer of other architects and, and uh, a character by the name of Henry Russell Hitchcock. Between those two poles, between the introduction of modernism as what I would say, and I think it, it's important for me to get this right and to make it clear, as a code, as a behavioral code. So this shows up in America in about 1928. Prior to that, in Europe, modernism is bumping around jostling between, you won't know all of these groups, it really doesn't matter so much, the futurists, the constructivists, the De Stijl guys, the Athens Charter guys, the Bauhaus guys, but a loose amalgamation. Uh, one thing is clear, there's an enemy. And the enemy is classical, neoclassical, uh, Beaux-Arts architecture in Europe and in America. But what's interesting to me about the period before this, the advent of the book is it's, it's a period of ferment and discussion and debate. So this is what we're interested in here. We're not interested in authorities and rules and methods and systems. So I'm not gonna come and say to you, look, kid, you want to be a radical architect? This is what you do. You draw it this way, you design it this way, you build it this way, that makes you a radical architect. You have to watch out for that. And, and that's what I mean by codification. When you think about your lives in conceptual ways and you think about your needs in emotional ways, there's a fundamental human interest in an order, a clarity, a belief system, a way of understanding. This is the way the world works. 
boys and girls. And forever in architecture and forever in a philosophical way, people are coming along, could be Newton, could be Darwin, could be Keynes, could be whatever philosopher you like, composer you like, and saying, okay, we've got it now, we've got it figured out. And what happens, and we can see this now maybe better from our vantage point in history than other people who came before us, almost inevitably a philo philosophical system, whatever it is, a design advocacy, whatever it is, cracks. It never includes everything. It always omits certain things. And I think from my point of view, and conceivably in a certain way at SciArc, we're interested in getting into the cracks. We're interested in what it doesn't include, what it leaves out, what it understands, what it misunderstands, what fits, and I think very importantly, what doesn't fit or misfit. And I think the point of this book is really to say now, modern architecture has arrived, 1928, 1930. That means you can teach it, I can teach it, you can learn it, I can repeat it, you can repeat it, and it's become a kind of codified system and a method. It still exists in some way. There's still people who advocate this. I think the SciArc point of view is a different point of view, as I said, and it's important to understand that. What we're looking for is we're looking for what they leave out. We're looking for what they didn't understand. So if I put something on the, up on the wall, I want you to say to me, that's what you think. This is what I think. So we're interested in how the discourse moves. I understand very well that that doesn't always happen. And I also understand very well that even if it happens, it doesn't happen from every seed in this room. But it'll happen. It'll change, it'll move, it'll evolve. That also doesn't mean it necessarily gets better. That's a different discussion, but it does get different. And I'm very interested, and I'm interested in you being interested in the difference. So this now, in a certain way, represents the, the end of the, peri the period of ferment, evolution, debate, and a codification. And then I, I, I show you uh, a very quick example, and this is a project uh, I did about 15 years ago, which Contrary to the tenets of modern architecture, which were given to me when I, was, when I was a student, we start to look for ways to say things that you can't say in the linguistics or in the code of modern architecture. I'll give you an example. Um, if somebody says, write me a sentence, and you say, okay, capital letter, Noun, verb, period, sentence. That's an English sentence. And somebody like E.E. E. Cummings or James Joyce, a writer like that, comes along and says, wait a minute, I can't say, I can't express, I can't communicate what I want to communicate with capital letter, noun, verb, period. You understand? That doesn't come to everybody but it comes to somebody. And therefore, there's really no pro forma for the English language a la James Joyce. I don't know how familiar you are with his work. It's actually quite old. It really belongs to, to the first half of the 20th century. And it's still odd as hell. He has one book called Finnegan's Wake that took 18 years to write. And there's a quote from him, something to the effect that, hey, it took me 18 years to write it it can take you 18 years to read it, uh, which means it doesn't have very many readers. I think th this is not necessarily an advocacy of, of obscuritanism in architecture, but it is to make the point that, that there will always be somewhere in this room or some other room a vantage point, a new perspective, new interests that aren't covered by the criteria that you're learning. So 
a critical intellectual approach to architecture means don't just learn it and give it back to me. Don't just regurgitate what I'm telling you. Your responsibility is to, to listen, to think about it, to consider it, and then to see not only what it leaves in, which is plausible, but what it omits, which is also important. I want to show this because this is clearly, and certainly when it was done, an exception to the standard pro forma. It's a model, it was a model made from a lemon rind, actually. It's, it's an office project of about uh, 5,000 uh, square meters. And then there is immediately, and I mentioned this with respect to Alexis, there's immediately a consideration about what is it, translation, how do you build it, and that curvilinear surface now became, is, is implemented with orthogonal pieces. And what are the orthogonal pieces? Orthogonal pieces are blocks. And if, you've, if you look at cement blocks or concrete blocks, little cement blocks are designed to build what? Big blocks. So you put a, little, a lot of little blocks together and you get big blocks, right? That's conceptually the way it works. When you stack them up, you get a certain kind of wall, you get a certain kind of shape. That's the idea. So in this case, the, the, the strategy was to implement the curvilinear surface with a module, and there are actually a thousand blocks in this, in this little building. There are a thousand blocks, they're all the same, and they're all different. Everyone is cut differently. This is in the era of transition from parallel rule, triangle, scale, pencil, to the computer era. So we're building something. I think this is interesting to me, maybe to you, maybe not. But we're building something we don't know how to build. And we can't dial up a rhino menu and see what operations are plausible or available. In other words, we're making something we don't know how to make. So we're using what we know, trying to integrate what we know with what we would like to do and arrive at a possible conclusion. And when you look at the, 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 con the, the result, or the final result, and you can see how we made a scaffold, which is a kind of analog form an analog shape, you can see the steel pipes. I don't want to go into all the details about this section, but, but a kind of seat of the pants way of making the building. And you can see what happened to the glass as the glass is actually obligated to behave as a consequence of what the block does. Uh, it's crude, actually. And I think we knew crude and rough and it's the, kind of, it's the kind of project that when we got to the end, when we finally got to the end, we understood how to do it. But when we started, we weren't really sure. And I think this is, this is, a, kind of, uh, this is a kind of sensibility, which I think it'll, it'll resonate with some of you, with others it may not. Now, we, we uh, dial up another uh, 12, 15 years, and we get various rhino menus. And now, you know, you want to do this, you want to do this, you want to do this, surface points, lines, shapes, and all of that are available to you. So there's the point in time where you're forcing the tools, meaning the drawing tools can't really produce what you want them to. And the technical side of implementation, meaning the construction methods, don't yet confirm that you can do what you're trying to do. So you're operating in a world where you're trying to obligate new tools, both in terms of drawing representation and new methods of construction. So now we come to this. You're familiar with all of this in Patrick's book, which, which we debated here at SciArc. And, and also in London uh, recently. Uh, and you can have a look at this. This is now analogous to Philip's book because Patrick is now saying that the contemporary codification of architecture belongs to something he's calling parametric architecture. So now we've, we've returned 
to all of the things I talked about, which is the need for a belief system, need for codification, need for something which you can learn and teach and repeat. So I think in, in a certain sense, the, the, the need for this, which is a human need, has to be resisted. And SciArc aspires to do that. And maybe some of you will too. Second piece of this discussion, and I'll, I'll, I'll do this quickly. Uh, I've, there, there's a project in Los Angeles that we've been involved in uh, for a couple of years. Um, and whether it goes or not is not yet a certainty. But it's one of the few projects in Los Angeles which is worthy of a contemporary discussion of large scale projects really not so much single buildings as multiple buildings with much broader conceptual, economic, political, sociological, and design ambitions. So I gave a talk the other day to the board of directors of the park that they want to build. Maybe some of you know it. It's over the 101 freeway. It's in Hollywood. Uh, so between the, uh, the 101 runs between Hollywood Boulevard and Sunset, roughly. And they want to bridge the freeway and build a park in that area. So I, I was talking to, these, to the board of directors the other day, and it started out uh, with this image. And keep in mind now we're in a completely different discussion. But the discussion is also an essential component of the world of SciArc as we know it. So now we're talking about a broader social, political context and the aspirations that I think not only belong to the school, but will be very much a part of your professional lives in terms of the kinds of projects that might come to you and how they might be handled. So. I, I, was, I was on a plane uh, the, the weekend and I, somebody gave me a copy of the Los Angeles Times. This was the first image that I showed. And there were two little stories here. It comes out of the opinion section, uh, or what's left of it, of the Los Angeles Times. And essentially there are two people commenting on, is it good to live downtown? Is it lousy to live downtown? Good or bad? And they're both terrible. They're both, they're, they're both very uninspiring, very boring, and anecdotal. And one of them essentially says if you hang around downtown, you get recipes from your friends and things like that. The other guy says if you hang around downtown, it's too dirty, and the guy peed on the wall or something like that. Nowhere, nowhere in this discussion is there any sense of a vision of what the city could be. What is the city? What should the city be? What ambitions should we have for the city? What goals, what targets? So you have all of this sort of chit chat which passes as, as, as an analysis, and, a, and not a very good one, of LA. Meanwhile, uh, in the world at large, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Shanghai, Mexico City, there are now agglomerations, really, that are no longer cities. I think in the future, Los Angeles will be one of those. If for no other reason than the venue of Los Angeles is almost infinite horizontally, there's a joke, an old joke. You take off from JFK, you're immediately over LA. So not quite true, but pretty close. So if, if you built that area to the density of, let's say, Shanghai, I think Shanghai is like 25 million people, you could probably get 50 million people into Los Angeles, which is now, depending on how you define the city, which is a separate question, maybe 10 or 12. So Los Angeles has an opportunity to be that kind of city, maybe. Meanwhile, New York Times upper left rebuild the Mississippi Delta. Can we do that? Should we do that? But it's an advocacy of, a, of an enormous project following on the disaster of, of Hurricane Katrina. But it speculates on what capacity we have in an architectural way, in a planning way, in an environmental way, designing, engineering, 
sociological way, political way, to look at problems at a much greater scale. Lower left, a few years ago, uh, uh, I, was, I, I picked this up in Incheon, which is the airport next to Seoul, and there was uh, a presidential campaign going on. And in the presidential campaign, one of the candidates had raised this question. If you know South Korea, there are two very large rivers, the Han and the Naktang River. And a proposal was to take about $30 million, go up in the mountains, blow up some of the terrain between the two rivers, and connect the two rivers. Can you imagine? And this was a presidential campaign. And they weren't arguing about should we raise the debt and a Tea Party and Murdoch and a lot of, a, a lot of issues which seem supercilious and not really very substantial. They were talking about a conception of a kind of linear city, recreational city, environmental city, business city, and so on and so on. And you can actually sail down the river from Japan through Korea to China. It's fascinating. And whether to do it or not, we could argue, but that the proposal was on the table, not from an architect sitting somewhere in a school, nobody listening, or maybe only a few, but from a primary politician running for election in South Korea, and he won. Meanwhile, in Switzerland, and it's worth paying attention to this, some people will say it's only tyrannical governments and not democratic governments. These are very different governments in very different parts of the world. So let's keep that in mind. Upper right is the Goddard Pass. And if you ever try to drive through the Swiss Alps and, or, or ride an elephant through the Alps or whatever people have done for hundreds of years, so just completed the tunnel called the Goddard Tunnel. It's 57 kilometers long, longest tunnel in the world in the most difficult circumstances, built, done. Meanwhile, this is, and this is probably the, the strangest of all, there's a river in northern, northern China has a lot of problems, as some of you know, with water and flooding, and all kinds of things. So they're moving the Yellow River, right? They're moving the river, the Yellow River, China's. They're moving it. They're not debating whether they should move it. So I don't necessarily show any of these and say, okay, do it. But what they all suggest is the potential to work on, on a colossal scale, conception-wise, environmentally, politically, socially. And it's important to keep that in mind. The reason I was showing it to these characters is just to say, this is what the world is doing. LA has had a reputation for design, for architecture, but architecture, qua architecture, meaning at the scale of building, it has no reputation whatsoever, neither does America, at the scale that we're talking about with those four projects, and there, there, there are many others. So I wanted to give a kind of impetus, a sort of hypodermic to these, to these guys and to say LA is a colossal canvas. It's a, the most promising venue in the world. And in some ways, people, we, one could argue that you come to LA in the best case to see what the future is or what it might be. Whereas many cities, you come to see what's established or what used to be. So LA might be able, there are some competitors obviously in East Asia, but potentially arguing to this group, LA has that promise to be the future. This uh, shouldn't be uh, misunderstood as, as, as silly or a caricature except to say that Los Angeles has, and I think deservedly so, a reputation of not only not focusing on particular subjects for very long, but tearing things down and putting things up very, very quickly over short periods of time. So the idea of durability in architecture. You'll hear a lot of discussion about the interrelationship of fashion and architecture fashion change and architecture. The difference with architecture is that billions of dollars of concrete go up and not so easily come down. 
So the fashion discussion is one that, 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 that has, to be, has to be scrutinized, but it's pretty clear, and this is, this is an example, that Los Angeles is a city that is more in process than it is a conviction about what it is and what it was and what it should be. That's good for you because it means the discussion is open and the possibilities are, are very substantial. This goes back to um, one of the cartoons which is very often <clears throat> rolled out about Los Angeles that it's not a city at all, but it's simply, and look at the date on this thing, it's simply, a, I mean, this tells, it's a great image, I have to say, I, I, I like the image. It tells you a hell of a lot if you look at it and you look at the, the people, the sociology of the people, the sort of family, the car, you know, the, the, the stick houses, and this is the, this is the San Fernando Valley. 50 years ago or something. I think that image is, is an antique. I think it's out of date. But the car culture and the idea of a city in pieces, I think, is, is, is still with us. Now, we were talking about, and, and this group uh, that, that I addressed is, is a collection of Hollywood designers, planners, business people. And I wanted to raise the issue that Hollywood has a pedigree of sorts, and probably the further away you get from it, the more compelling it is. Uh, it's not particularly compelling to me, maybe not to you, but having to do with the celebrity culture of people in the movies, those kinds of, those kinds of issues, and, and, and Hollywood is often merchandised, sold in that way. And I'm arguing there are other ways to, to, to encourage people to come and build and, and, and review the context of the city. But this is Musso, which is a, a, a restaurant that goes back uh, almost 100 years in the Pantages. And Capitol Records actually is the site. There are New York developers working there. There's a huge high-rise complex going up in Hollywood. So that's just in a lot of arguments about that, how to save the old, how to preserve the old, all of that. Uh, and then the, the Chinese and the Brown Derby. And then there's a further argument about Los Angeles. I think Los Angeles has, has a history which is both superior and inferior in the sense that Chamber of Commerce types, people who promote the city, often look at it and say, with respect to other cities, do we have one of those? Do we have Fifth Avenue or the Ginza or the uh, Champs-Élysées and the Arc de Triomphe? Oh, we don't have one of those? We don't qualify as a contemporary city, so let's make one. And, and the, uh, the efforts uh, to make Wilshire Boulevard, the so-called Miracle Mile, I think originate in a sense that for Los Angeles to qualify as a legitimate contemporary city, it would have to have one of those. One other point, this is uh, uh, Rainer Banham's book, some of you may know, he's an English critic. Uh, and then his introduction by uh, Tony Vidler, who uh, runs Cooper Union uh, at the moment. But one of the things you'll find out about Los Angeles is that historically, whatever Los Angeles is, the discourse largely comes from outside Los Angeles. It comes from the pages of Domus or A Plus U or Rainer Banham or Tony Vidler. It's much less defined by the people who are here. I think Syarch has, has made a substantial effort to change that discussion. I think ultimately, whatever Los Angeles is or might be or can come to be ought to be decided based on the strengths and the capacity of this city as we see it as opposed to measuring it, measuring it against Fifth Avenue or the Champs-Élysées. Finally, the, the, the city of Los Angeles arguably shouldn't be here at all. There's no water. Uh, and uh, this is middle of the 19th century, the opening of what they call the Los Angeles aqueduct. So intrinsic to the, to the durability of this city 
is an aspect of experiment on a very large scale. That's not new. So when we talk about the park, the precedent could be 150 years ago and the fact that the city brought water here which enabled the city to exist. And the further extension of that is, I mean, if you look in books and you look in magazines and people will talk about unusual pieces of architecture in LA, but as an experience, you gotta go find them. I mean, many of the times, somebody will call my office. I mean, I'm just in town from Vienna. I'm just in town from Shanghai. We're looking for so-and-so and so-and-so. Where the hell is it? We can't find it. Uh, because what defines the city largely is the river, the euphemistically a river in concrete, the LA River, or the freeway system, or the power grid system, or the old train system, which in many ways has zoned the city and segregated the city. These are the boulevards in Los Angeles which play a kind of analogous role, and that's the 101, that, that, the 101 freeway it comes through. But if you know the city a little bit and somebody says, oh, I live east of the 405, means one thing. I live west of the 405. I live north of the 10. I live south of the 10 and so on. And you can see how the structure of the freeways, civil engineered freeways, designed to make the logistics of power or water or cars operate. They don't do that either. The cars don't move, the trains don't move, the power doesn't move, and so on. They don't work in the engi civil engineering terms they were, to, they were intended to work on. And they have zoned the city and segregated the city in a way that makes it difficult to connect over, under, and around those big hunks of infrastructure. And there were, before I showed the project, which is not a very interesting project, it's, it's, it's their proposal. I wanted to remind the audience, and this, this seemed, I have a little boy, he's nine years old, we were reading this not so long ago. Uh, it's Jules Verne. Uh, some of you know 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. This is another book uh, that he wrote. But it's odd, actually, and surprising that somebody would talk about America in this way. And if you think about the, 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 the skepticism we have in many ways about America's capacity to do things, bridges, dams, trains. I mean, we're building a train in LA. That one of the, I mean, you look at the train that runs from Shanghai to, to Beijing now, about 200 kilometers an hour, and they're still arguing about the train in LA, which the mayor recently said will reach Santa Monica down Wilshire Boulevard in 2032 which means nobody's really taking it seriously. On top of which, the train they're building is a 19th century train. If you look at the train and the wires and so on and so on. So we have a ways to go, and yet it's interesting to me that, that the French would look at America in terms of an infinite capacity to invent and willingness to do that. So it existed once, it's conceivable this is probably self-explanatory that it could exist again. So this is the area we were, which was the subject of the discussion, uh, this park uh, over the freeway, which again lends itself to infrastructure subdivides the city. The new park, whatever it is, whatever it contains, is a way of knitting it back together in a sociological way, in an architectural way. And this was, they asked me to say something about what it could be. What could be in the park? Give us an example. And most people think uh, the Bois de Boulogne, the Central Park, the, the Ueno Park in Tokyo. This is a different kind of park. It's fascinating. It's early 18th century Mogul. It's in a city called Jaipur, which is a little bit south and east of Delhi in India. And the ruler made this, and it is a park, it's a public park, with all these astronomical instruments. It's like a cosmological park. It's fascinating in an architectural way. And you see kids climbing all over this thing, all over these pieces of equipment which trace the sun and the moon and the stars and so on. But it's an idea, it's an initiative, and it also suggests, by the way, that what's old isn't necessarily passe 
and that there are certain pieces of our history which are worth looking at and understanding and maybe in a different form using again. So this is up to us, you included. I think the argument, the Sciarc argument, and a personal argument is that we don't want to make tomorrow on the model of yesterday. We don't want to do that. We want to intervene in that process and suggest that, that what's coming needn't replicate what preceded it, but could be a different way to see, to think, and understand about the world that's coming. And you can make that happen. Thank you very much. If there are questions, please raise your hand and wait for the mic. Uh, would you consider parametric architecture now as described or described as a behavioral code, much like modernism as a behavioral code? I think what we want to do is make sure that doesn't happen. And I don't think Patrick thinks that's what's happening. But I think when, when you set down rules, systems, methods, on top of which, when you entitle it the avant-garde, I mean, ipso facto, the avant-garde can't have a rule system if what I'm saying is correct, which means an exploratory venue means, like the building project I showed you, you're a little bit clumsy and a little bit unsure, a little bit uncertain. You have some idea what you're looking for and you have some idea how to find it, but you might find that you can't find it, or you might find something else. And I think in my, my sense of what Patrick is advocating is that he's already answered all of his own questions in a fundamental way, what it means and, and what it should look like and why it looks like what it should look like. And the why explains the premise of his definition of radicalism. I mean, there's a kind of argument for egalitarianism. I, I give it to you in two ways. If you look at the Philip Johnson end or the Mies end and you say, okay, we don't know what the culture, what the culture will bring us in the future. So we make something austere, orthogonal, a block, a box. And then you can come along and you can do whatever the hell you want in the box. You can do that. And you may want to do something and I may want to do something and they're all different. So there's a kind of conceptual neutrality to that idea. And there's something of that in the 1928 book. The other end of that is a kind of specificity, which I think is, is strangely very directly related to the lack of specificity 80 years before, which is, okay, we'll make something which wiggles. Yeah, I'm not saying we haven't made anything that wiggles, but that's a separate decision. And it wiggles for what reason? It wiggles for an egalitarian reason, because some people want this width and this view. Other people want this width, other people want, and so on and so on. So that the idea of, of differentiation in very specific terms, has to do with an argument for offering very different living, working, entertaining opportunities to people who might inhabit the building. Now, whether the right number of people, I mean, you could argue in a neutral sense, if you, if you made the building a la mis and could fill it in any way you want, that, uh, that also begs the question about how individuals ought to be served or taken care of individual by individual. I think both of the systems have an idea that what they're serving or, sol or solving 
are the needs, the collective needs of very different populations. And the question is not only how to, how to serve those, but I think what sort of vis visible conceptual image best represents that intention. So the box and the language of the box and the expression of the structure and the materials is one thing, and the sort of variability with odd skins and photovoltaic skins and all of that represents a different point of view. But I think the similarities are important to understand. And I think, again, we're looking for the exceptions. We're looking for what they leave out. We're looking for flaws in the argument, and we're looking to move the discussion we're not looking to simply acknowledge the argument and say, let's do more of that. Hey. I'm just curious because they, whoa, <laughs> they seem like massive urban planning challenges. And I'm just, right, and just in general, I mean, I just got to the city, and I have these, I don't know, anecdotal ways of looking at LA as kind of this massive driving. I'm from up north, Palo Alto, um, and no, so I know San Francisco better. But yeah, <laughs> I, didn't, I never lived there officially, so I can't say I know it really well. But um, I mean, it still has still not my favorite thing to do there either. So my question is how architects intersect and like what their role is in these big developmental problems or challenges, I guess. Is that a question? <laughs> Say it again. I guess I'm wondering what an architect's role with urban planning is currently. Well, I, think, I think it's an interesting question and I think by my lights, there isn't an obvious answer. There's a pretty clear answer to the kinds of building projects that we talk about conventionally in architecture. And when you're talking about very large scale projects like the, the one over the freeway or like the Goddard Tunnel or like the Move the River, the constituency is different and the input is different and probably the voice of the architect, and it has, to, it, it has to be very strong, I think, and very precise, but it has to be a little bit malleable because you're dealing with bigger populations on an enormous scale with consequences which are much more substantial, at least in scale, than they would be if you were simply doing a building. But that's the challenge of the process. I didn't say all of you will wind up doing that. But what I'm saying is some of you will. And it's important from my point of view to make it clear to you that that discussion is not just hypothetical. It's not just academic. It's plausible and doable. And the consequences of implementing projects like that are enormous. And in a certain sense, the wonderful, the opportunities are wonderful. That doesn't mean you couldn't screw up a hell of a lot more than you could with, with a simple building. And if you tried to move the Danube in Austria uh, or the Hudson or something, or never mind what you do with the Mississippi Delta, you're operating in a very different political context in America, decision-making context, uh, decision -making context context of discourse and so on. But to assert the role and the intelligence of architecture at a strategic level, not so much is it round, is it square, is it red, is it green, not at that level, but as a conceptual thinker about the environment, which now includes bigger populations and bigger issues. I think is, is an important aspiration for you. And exactly how it's done, I think, depends on where it's done and probably in a, in a more personal way, also depends on you and your capacity to, to engage a lot of these bigger questions and to talk about them in a way that they won't say, well, she can make a building she can make a hospital or a jail or a house or something. But now we're talking about 
broader social and political transportation, environmental, to be able to talk about that and to talk about it intelligently, which means in a, in, in a very fundamental way to enlarge your frame of reference and then your capacity to do that, because there are people who have that capacity. So you put yourself in a situation like that and you have an opportunity to work at, I think, a colossal scale, an ambitious scale, and to deal now with, with the kinds of problems that could only be touched incrementally, at least historically, and now can be done at one shot. I mean, in Switzerland, they, the tunnel you mentioned, and the Godard Tunnel, and how they got it done really quickly, do you think that pu the public just isn't unified in some sort of idea that the city could change for the better, and that's a problem? Well, uh, Switzerland is different than America, uh, well, which is yes, different than Korea and different than China. And there are probably, you know, you, you talk to the Chinese and they look back at America and they say, all you guys do is argue, you know? If you look at the discussion, I mentioned it briefly, of the train down Wilshire Boulevard, you can, it's been argued about for 25 years, literally 25 years. Um, I think there, there have to be, and this is probably the subject for another discussion, there have to be ways of intervening in the layers of political and economic bureaucracy that burden America's decision-making capacity, that emasculate it. It's very difficult to do things. I mean, you got a group of people here that, that actually, power, relatively speaking, powerful people in the political community, the business community, and the design community, and they're having a hell of a tough time building that park in different cultures, in different countries, the circumstances would be different. It's not that, I mean, every character who lives in that neighborhood, who has an apartment overlooking the site, can theoretically roadblock this thing and file this and file that and all of that. So there has to be a way, and I think there is, of intervening in that process and allowing the country to behave more decisively in the interests and in, in how you define public interest, so this is of course always always a subject, a subject, a topic. But to define public interest is not synonymous with deba debating it infinitely, or emasculating it to the point where the essential purposes of a project are lost. And I think that's one of the big issues for America, and it's certainly a big issue in LA. That's why I was saying to these, to these people, symbolically, in a national sense, never mind in a local sense, it's critical that we do this kind of project. Otherwise, everybody else runs away with a discussion. And from a SciArc point of view, we don't want to see that happen. That's a good question. Anyway, thank you very much. I'll see you all soon.